This is Paul Burnett interviewing George Lightman for the University History Series. And it is our first session, and we're here in Berkeley, California. And uh, it's February 12th, 2018. So uh, in oral histories, it's customary to begin at the beginning. But uh, I think it would be great to fill in as much detail as we can about, uh, about your ancestry. Tell us about your, your parents, your grandparents, and if possible, your great-grandparents. Very good. So you want me to start? Sure. Very good. Well, <clears throat> I was born on the 24th of May, 1925. It was a Sunday morning, 5 o'clock, I was told, uh, in 1925. And uh, my parents were Joseph and Stella Lightman. My mother's na na maiden name was Fisher. And uh, they came. I think in almost every branch of the family from a completely assimilated Jewish family uh, for most of the generations that I dealt with, which is really primarily my two grandmothers. Uh, the, uh, the attachment to religion was only two ways. They did celebrate the high holidays, uh, but none of the other ones really. And particularly my father was, uh, he was probably already an agnostic, uh, given his World War experiences. Uh, and uh, so we felt we were Austrians. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the previous generations, for the most part, my, my parents, uh, my uh, grandparents, and certainly before that, were citizens of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, which is a small, which I guess by 1800 was a small part of the real empire, Maria Theresa, and uh, they felt, even though they weren't all born in Vienna, uh, that they were truly Austrians, uh, a multinational state, of course, the the monarchy. I don't know how many nationalities, but it was by the dozens. Mm and uh, all the major religions. And so we, we felt at home. My father uh, was uh, the oldest child of five, of whom one had died as a baby, uh, born in, 19, in 1894 uh, to Alexander, my paternal grandfather and his wife, Cecilia, sometimes called Sevia for some reason. I think it was probably the Polish name. Mm. They came from the Austrian part of Poland, and in fact, which abutted the Russian Empire directly. In fact, the capital of that province was Krakow, and it was directly on the Russian border. So it was a military zone for uh, most of that period, uh, given the relations with, with Russia. And uh, my uh, grandfather, Alexander, uh, obviously uh, started the military career very early. His family in particular had two older brothers and his father had emigrated to uh, Great Britain in probably the 1870s or 1880s, something like that. So he was the only one of that part of the family that remained in the, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, he started working for uh, the military, uh, starting as a non-commissioned officer. And uh, he was born in 1864, so this must have been probably in the 1880s that he started this military career. I mm. looked at his record, he was qui went quickly to sergeant, and then was advanced uh, to uh, second lieutenant, first lieutenant, major, and finally, his highest rank was lieutenant colonel. Now it's interesting. I looked this up in connection with the uh, with the interview that the administrative services uh, of the military uh, had civilian ranks as well as military ranks, or at least civilian titles. For example, the medical officers were called arzt, oberarzt, unterarzt, all that, uh, and then had the equivalent military rank. 
So my uh, grandfather's uh, uh, civilian rank was Oberrechnungsrat, second class. If it had been first class, he would have been a full colonel. He was a very patriotic monarchist. Even when I met him, I don't remember this because he died uh, before I was four years old. And uh, he, uh, uh, he was a, a true patriot. In fact, he was decorated with the highest uh, honor of the empire uh, that was available to ordinary citizens, and not crown princes or people like that. And the grandiose title of that uh, medal was the Golden Cross of Merit with crown on the ribbon of the Medal of Valor. And I have, a, I have this, the family preserved that, and we were able to bring that with us. Uh, I don't know very much about my grandmother's family. In fact, I know almost nothing. Mm. Uh, she must have come from the same part uh, of the empire because they were, were obviously married while he was probably a sergeant. Uh, they had uh, four children. Well, f five actually, three, uh, four girls, and my father, who was the oldest, born in 1894. Uh, one of the girls died as a baby, so my father then had three surviving sisters, uh, Aunt Rose, Aunt Adele, and Aunt Giselle, or Germany Gisela. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that the two middle sisters, in other words, Adele and Adele, as she later got to be mine, and Giselle married two distant cousins from the United States, from a family, the Kinspell family from California. And I think maybe that wasn't so unusual. They had come to the United States around the uh, 1800s. Uh, 1850s, I think? Around, around there. Around yeah. there? So yeah. In the middle. It, and it was all very, very obvious because that was, of course, the emancipation in Europe. And uh, those Jews who, who saw the pogroms going on in Russia and places like that, right. they, they wanted to leave. That family did very well, the Kinspells. They uh, owned land in the Central Valley. And they also operated, I, I don't know for how long, a stagecoach between Fresno and Bakersfield. Uh, they sold that property. I never met uh, Anna Dale's husband. He died before I was born. Uh, and uh, moved to San Francisco, uh, I think maybe just in time for the earthquake. Oh, goodness. Uh, and uh, Giselle, the youngest uh, of my father's sisters, died in the flu epidemic at the end of the First World War. Mm. So Aunt Adele really, and Aunt Rose, who, who's of course stayed in Vienna, were my two aunts. Aunt Adele I hadn't met, uh, except indirectly. She enrolled me in the Red Cross, United States Red Cross, and for every birthday during that four or five year period, uh, I got uh, a gold five dollar piece. So I don't know what happened to those. <laughs> <laughs> what, did, can I ask if, sure, if, of course. The, if um, the, so your, your aunts moved out to California to be with the Kinspells, That's obviously. Right. That's right. And they met by, because there were family connections they and were, they would they visit. They were very distant cousins, I right. understand. Yeah. Right. And, and they would come and visit. And, and you well, got they to actually know went to Europe to, to find the brides. Right. Yeah, I think that's the story I got. You know, this is all secondhand, of course. Uh, so uh, the, the, the uh, Kinspell uh, who married the youngest one, Giselle. Uh, of course, they didn't have any children because she died uh, before that period, eight, 1917, something like that. Yeah. Uh, and Aunt Adele, uh, who married another Kinspell, uh, her husband also died before uh, I had a chance to meet him, so I did not know him. Aunt Adele uh, and her husband had two sons, my first cousins, uh, Charlie, who stayed home, was a mama's boy, 
and uh, Alfred, cousin Al, who was one of my favorite cousins, in fact. In fact, he died, I think, maybe seven or eight years ago at the age of 94, and I was the executor of his estate four or five years prior to that already. He had uh, retired to Long Beach. And uh, that, that means, that leaves him. And Rose, uh, who, who stayed in Vienna, mm -hmm. she married Uncle Frederick, or we called him Fritz, uh, Gorvitz. And uh, they lived in a very nice house in the amusement park of the Prata, which is the huge uh, uh, green area, emperor's riding area. A favorite place of mine, of course, because A, they had a candy store with it, so it's sort of delicatessen candy store. And more importantly, uh, they had three children. Uh, Kurt, who was the youngest, he was younger than I was, and uh, two girls, Martha and Kay, and Martha was the, med the middle one. She was about a year older uh, than I was, and then Aunt Kay, uh, Cousin Kay. Uh, and I, I always had to be beautifully dressed and groomed when I visited there, and that never lasted more than five minutes because they were, they were really a, a, a place of freedom for me, and I always loved to go there in addition to, of course, the candy. They were feral children where they were going out and then oh, getting yeah, in and trouble. Oh, yeah, and particularly or... Martha <laughs> turned out to be a real tomboy. We, we were the terror of the neighborhood. And uh, as soon as I was going to be picked up, of course, I got redressed and everything and cleaned up. It was a wonderful place. Uh, my mother took me to the Prater uh, quite often because we lived about maybe 15 or 20 minutes walking distance from there. And that's a park, the Prater? The or? Prater is a huge park. Uh, it's where the emperor and the nobility uh, went horseback riding and, and they had trails and uh, meadows and, and all along that middle alley uh, with all the big trees, there were coffee houses and restaurants and, and uh, all kinds of nice, there was a stadium there. And then the amusement park was part of that. It was a very complete amusement park. It's known worldwide because of its giant Ferris wheel, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's, that's, that was the entrance to the park. Mm. And there were merry-go-rounds. There, there was uh, a, a village of little people. They had their own post office and their own railroad in the park. And, and so it was a wonderful place, you know. So the, the first part of my life, until 1938, I was a very happy child. <coughs> For example, the first three or four years, uh, my father, who had been a, a volunteer in the First World War, uh, was wounded twice on the Serbian front. After the war, went to, I think, a commercial college and became an accountant. He worked for a government concern. I think it was even a, a military concern because I know that he had contact with the uh, Afghan minister of war. Uh, and I remember that he showed me once that once he had communicated with him, uh, th that Afghan minister had, I guess, come to Austria to buy arms. And the return letter said that, unfortunately, the minister had just been hanged. <laughs> so <laughs> my father was a stamp collector, so he kept all these things, you see. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, he was an avid fisherman. Uh, I was taught swimming before I was three years old because he used to take me on his boat. And he wa People didn't wear life vests in those days. And uh, when I was a little older, in fact, I was drafted to row his boat at five o'clock in the morning. So I never became a fisherman, also because I didn't know how to take the hooks out. So uh, I didn't. And uh, uh, it was, it was a happy time. Uh, until about 1931 or two, we used to go to a, uh, it's a part of Austria, which is, I guess, northeast of Vienna, 
a little valley and a stream that was a tributary of the, the Danube, where my father did his fishing. And we moved into, usually it took uh, quarters in a farm. Mm -hmm. And my father would commute. He would come up by train on the weekend and then go back. Uh, and uh, it, it was a happy time. You know, I, I, uh, I have no bad experiences. I had my first girlfriend at the age of three or four. Uh, there are pictures available of that. <laughs> and uh, so it, it was great. Uh, I, uh, that, that continued actually uh, really almost the end. Now I, I was, uh, uh, I was uh, witness, indirect witness to many events that jump back in, into my mind. But let me, before I go to that period, uh, say a few words about my mother's family. Yeah. Uh, she uh, married one of the brothers, the Fisher brothers, who had an apartment house and a dry goods clothing store, a very large one that took up the whole corner of the apartment house on the ground floor. Uh, they came uh, from southern Hungary, I think a city called Seget, a and my mother uh, of course, was born in Vienna, but my grandmother, her mother, always lived with us because she had inherited that apartment house. Uh, and uh, when her husband died, one of the two Fisher brothers, and uh, she had already probably when they lived there, converted two of the regular apartments into a very large apartment in that on the first floor, not the ground floor, but the first floor of that apartment house. I think it was a four-story apartment house, probably from the early 1800s mm -hmm. still. In a very convenient place, we lived uh, half a block away from a large open-air market. Uh, the uh, uh, clothing store, of course, didn't exist anymore. It had been taken over by a painting a chemical supply place. I still remember the name of the people who owned it. The name was Jalud, it's spelled Z-A-L-U-D. Some of these things come back to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very nice apartment. They uh, had a small uh, uh, living area, what we would call, I guess, the family room next to the kitchen. We had two hallways because the public hallways had become hallways in the apartment. So we had an indoor toilet, very important, because in those days the toilets were in the hallway outside the apartments. So we, uh, we were the only apartment with a private toilet, and we had a very large bathroom. Important to my father because he was uh, an amateur photographer and developed his own film, and he had his equipment in there, always burned holes in his underwear because he, <laughs> because he was doing this, uh, developing in his underwear. <laughs> and and uh, my mother, because she had a bad experience one summer when she was a child, when they went uh, to the fish market in Italy, saw the worms crawling out of the fish. She never touched another piece of fish almost till the end because she was fooled at the end, but mm. certainly for her first 90 years. Uh, and uh, my father, who would cheat a little bit sometime, and if he didn't catch fish, he would buy them from the other fishermen, bring them home live, and dump them into our bathtub. And my poor mother not only had to live with that, but also prepare the fish, of course. <laughs> we, we did have a maid uh, who did some of the cooking. And we had two maids that came once a month to clean the whole apartment. Uh, and I still remember them wearing uh, felt slippers to polish the parquet floors. You know, it was that kind of thing. High ceilings, uh, double doors that were the whole height, you know, with uh, purple curtains, you know, velvet curtains and all that. The formal room, which was used very little, was the dining room, living room. It had two, two of those double windows with balconies and uh, a grand piano where I took my piano lessons five years and didn't learn anything but scales. And uh, uh, my grandmother's part of the apartment was beyond as far away from the rest of the apartment, the rest of the rooms. And uh, 
the entry hall that led to the kitchen uh, had two double windows, one of which had been converted into a cage for my father's uh, little parrots, budgies. Mm -hmm. I think there were about 30 of them. And one tame one, I guess the mother had died or thrown her out, little blue and white one, and she always stayed under the furniture until we came home. Then she would hop up and give us a kiss. I remember that. Wow. We also had, when I was the age that I had begun to talk about, uh, a dog, a wirehead terrier. And it's interesting because I was able to bring along uh, a uh, stiff toy of a wirehead terrier, which is downstairs in my daughter's uh, study. So. Uh, to complete my mother's family, she had an older brother and an older sister. Brother was the oldest, Uncle Paul, and the sister's name, Elizabeth. Elizabeth had married uh, a uh, retired captain in the Austrian cavalry. So even in those days, Jews could, you know, have a career of that type. It wasn't possible in Germany. And Franz Joseph was a fairly liberal emperor. And uh, they had a daughter, my uh, cousin Maria, Mary in those days, who was eight years older than I was, I think born in 1917. I know this because I just looked at her obituary. <laughs> uh, she became a child actress first with the Max Reinhardt uh, School of Acting, had their own theater uh, group and uh, then uh, went to the academy uh, and uh, also to a dancing school. And uh, I won't jump ahead now because that'll be part of the regular story. Right. Uh, they lived in a, in a better part of Vienna than we did. Uh, they always had higher pretensions, I guess is the word I would use. <laughs> Uncle Max, who uh, on occasion couldn't pay all his bills. My father sort of was the part of familia for the whole family. Uh, he would cover his checks, I remember that. <laughs> they lived in one of those fancy apartment houses with a, an elevator through the middle of the apartment, outdoor elevator with steps on both sides. Right. And uh, over the front door of their apartment, my uncle's cross sabers hung, you know, this, I remember that very well. So, and he smoked cigars and he was bald. <laughs> uh, He's so, a dramatic character yeah, in your he was, childhood. Yeah, yeah, and he, 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 he had a motorcycle. Uh, and so it, it was interesting. Uncle Paul, uh, I really didn't get to know because he had been a lieutenant in the Austrian artillery uh, in the First World War and was captured in the first year of the war when the Russians uh, took over a, a fortress in that part of Austria, again, the Austrian, uh, the uh, Polish part, Przemysl. I'm not going to spell that for you because <laughs> it has P R Z S, you know, the regular Polish words. And so, interestingly, he did not return, because this is also before my time, until 1920. The war ended in 1918. He was given up for dead. One day, the f I know this from what I was told. The doorbell rang and there was Uncle Paul. He had been in a prisoner of war camp in Siberia and the revolutionary period extended long be beyond the, the, uh, the Russian white revolution. Russians right, Russians. Yeah, he fought war. his way across revolutionary Russia with the Czech Brigade. And then once he was in Czechoslovakia, was in those Bohemia and Moravia, uh, he uh, he turned up in Vienna hmm. two years after the war. So he uh, enrolled at the university, the Technical University of Vienna, and became a chemical engineer, uh, got a master's degree that was required for a professional degree. Until uh, 1929, the economic situation in Europe in general, in particular, was very, very bad. He spoke, of course, perfect Russian, having been there for almost five years in Siberia. And uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union in those days was uh, 
building up its industry. And so they invited foreign engineers in particular uh, to take on jobs. And in 19, I think 29, he left his family behind, a wife, Alice, and a daughter, Elfie or Elfrida, uh, and took a job and became the director of a chemical plant in what was then under the Soviet Union called Sverdlovsk. It was Ekaterinburg where the Tsarish family had been done away with. And then in the early 1930s, maybe 32 or so, he was offered a bigger job in Moscow, and so he took that again as a director of a chemical plant. And his wife and daughter, Aunt Alice and, and uh, cousin Elfie, joined him there. And again, uh, just to end that story uh, until a later time, in 1937 he was given a choice, become a Soviet citizen or leave. And he maybe didn't make a mistake. At any rate, he decided to leave and come back to Vienna. And that only lasted about four months because then the Nazis came in. So interesting. Now, uh, uh, there is a, a little side story with my Aunt Alice. Uh, her maiden name was Zobelzon, Alice Zobelzon. And Karel Zobelzon was a second cousin of hers. Uh, later was Karl Radek, and he was probably the major, one of the major movers of the uh, Russian Revolution. Uh, a great uh, friend and, and protege of Lenin's. Then when Stalin came in, Stalin hated him because uh, Radek had a sense of humor and Stalin did not. So uh, he eventually became a victim of the trials the, uh, in Moscow. I think he was put on trial in 1936, 30, I think. Yeah, 36, that's something like that. Yeah. He and his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And he had such a sense of humor. And I read this in, in a historical novel by Stefan Heim uh, called Radek, uh, that he wrote the script for his own trial. And he was not condemned to death. Uh, he, he and his girlfriend were sent to Siberia to a gulag, but only lasted a week, so that was all, of course, arranged. Right. Uh, so now I can uh, go back to my early days, say the first four or five years. Uh, I entered uh, grammar school at the age of six. It was very close to where we lived, uh, maybe two or three blocks, so I was able to walk to, to school. And there again, I remember all these particular things. One of them is that I talked too much, and my mother was always being called in about that. Uh, I have photographs of me carrying my little lunchbox in a basket around my neck. And in connection with lunches, uh, the, the milk that we got for lunch was kept in little uh, water trays on the radiators to, to stay warm because everything was in glass containers in those days. There right. were no plastic containers. So that's the, and, and the headmaster's uh, name stands out in my mind. His, mind, his family name was Imofoil, all, always full. Hmm. So that, those are little things that somehow pop back into my mind. There was an earlier thing that I just thought of it, uh, remembering things that you wouldn't expect to remember. Mm -hmm. When I was three, four years old, my parents had enrolled me in a French kindergarten, very small one with about eight or ten kids and two, two teachers. And there I had a bad experience because they took us to the park and I stood up in the taxi with another kid, the teacher and the other three kids or so uh, sat down and as we rounded the corner of the Ringstrasse, which is the big boulevard around the inner city, going very slowly, fortunately. He opened the door. He was holding me, and we both fell out. He fell on top of me, and I fell onto streetcar tracks, and the streetcar was coming along. And the only thing that saved my life at the time was the streetcars in Vienna to this day have cow catchers. And he was able to slow down sufficiently and scoop me up with the other kid on top of me. And I was out for about a week. Uh, so. 
I, you I were was, injured, weren't you? Well, I, no, I fell right on my face. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I broke my nose and, you know, whatever. Uh, I was disenrolled from that kindergarten. <laughs> that, that, that was something that stuck in my mind. Yeah. Now, as a, go ahead. You, you well, a I, I, um, so the portrait that I'm getting is, on the one hand, tremendous stability. Like, in some ways, this is kind of an idyllic childhood where you're surrounded by family. There are, um, you know, cousins down the street. And uh, you can go to your, your, your uncle's candy store. Oh, and yeah. It's beautiful parks. And I think about the larger context. This is the jewel in the crown of, this, of, of empire. This is Vienna. Yeah. And no longer an empire. <laughs> but, you know, yes. But to this day, it thinks they are an empire. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, it certainly has that, that feeling. And, and in those days, and in the days of your parents and your grandparents, a center of, of imperial uh, action, prosperity, uh, technological advance. And uh, when I was going through your autobiographical pieces and the other interviews that you've done, and we'll list them in the, in the oral history uh, uh, transcript, that uh, um, so many of your male relatives were military men. Right? So your father, your grandfather, two of your uncles, officers in the Austro-Hungarian military, fought in World War I, fought before that. Um, your grandmother, born in, you know, amongst the cannon fire in the, in the Austro-Prussian uh, yeah, War. Yeah, Moravia, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, so I think about this contrast of a stable, prosperous, peaceful environment and a violent, hostile, unstable, dangerous environment, all in the same place. And I'm not sure I have a question about that, but I suppose the question could be something like, as a child, how did you absorb that? Your, uh, was it perhaps just that your uncle had these swords that were crossed at the entrance and it was a romanticized... I, I certainly had no notion of being in that milieu. I mean, it was my daily life. And so, the, you know, I certainly had no sense of history at that age. Yeah. That came much later, of course. Right. Uh, but I did experience historical events at a very early age. Uh, for example, uh, in the early 1930s, we stopped going to uh, the farmhouse in the little river was called the Kamp, K-A-M-P. Mm -hmm. And my father bought a piece of land at a lake called the Old Danube, which to this day is a very popular place. And we built a little house, a little country house, which my father designed and then got an architect to help him. Uh, and so we spent uh, our summers, our even after I started school, uh, at that place because it, it was within reach by streetcar at one end of the lake, and then my father had a big boat, so he would go to his p place of business by boat, get on the streetcar, and then roll back across the lake, that kind of thing. Uh, and that seemed all perfectly natural. There was nothing esoteric or special about that. Uh, so, uh, as you say, it, it, it was certainly for the most part not unexpected of me. I know we, we were fairly well off. I had friends who weren't quite as well off, but certainly I, I didn't know any indigent, you know, people. They obviously existed. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, I think at that age, and I'm talking up up to the age of maybe 12 or so, uh, I was aware of events. For example, in the winter of 1934, uh, the country was split, as it very often is politically. The, the, the cities, the big cities, are usually left-wing, and the countryside is right-wing. In Austria, right-wing meant, meant fascist. Mm -hmm. We had a fascist party. Uh, the left Italian, Italian yeah, the left style. Yeah. yeah, right, sort of Italian style. It was Count Steinberg, 
who was the head of that fascist party. Uh, they had their own militia. Vienna was, I, I know the percentages, I probably could look it up, but certainly for the most part, social democratic. There was a communist party, which was relatively small, uh, but uh, the social democrats at, uh, you know, were the major party. They had built huge blocks of apartment houses for, for the workers, and their Karl Marx, Hof, and all these things, all still in existence. Mm. Uh, and uh, then the, the fascists took over. First chancellor, fascist chancellor, was a little guy by the name of Dolfus, D-O-L-F-U-S, or sharp S, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and so there was an uprising because they were beginning to introduce legislation that was clearly along the Italian fascist model, Mussolini's model. And there was a, a the, the government called it the Civil War, mm -hmm. lasted only about three weeks. Uh, the Social Democrats and their left-wing allies, or the communists, uh, they called it the Workers' Uprising. So it was, you know, it depends on how you look at it. And it was brutally uh, defeated when first the fascist militia started. To, the workers had built up, you know, fortresses. If you look at these very large apartment blocks that still exist today, they always were a whole block with an outer wing and then a, an inside wing, sort of like fortresses. a houseman, houseman style, right? Yeah, apartments. Uh, and uh, the, as I say, most of those are, in, uh, and you can still see. It, today, uh, the effect of, of the Civil War, you know, the, the patches that had been, uh, you know, they were painted over eventually, but you could tell that they'd been heavily, because eventually the army took over uh, to put this down, and they brought in artillery and aircraft both, mm -hmm. and that, of course, you know, nobody could resist that. So that Civil War ended uh, within a, about a three-week period. Uh, direct involvement was that just at the corner of our block where the where the open air market was they had set up a machine gun nest you know with, with uh, sandbags and I could hear it chatter once in a while mm -hmm. so I guess they were shooting at people uh, the uh, the Jews of Vienna I don't again know the percentages overwhelmingly were social Democrats mm. because the alternative was a fascist party essentially and uh, and of course the Viennese in general were, were uh, left of center. So the the main support for the fascist party and eventually for the Nazis really came from the countryside, yeah. which was at that time about two thirds of the country. And Vienna was almost a third of the population of the whole country. You know, it's two million and then maybe six six and a half million people, yeah. and it's pretty much the same now. So uh, the alternative at that time, as far as my family was concerned, they weren't happy w with uh, the fascist government. And in fact, neither were the Nazis, because in the summer of 1934, uh, there was a, a Nazi coup. They uh, stormed the chancellor's, Dorfus's uh, offices which were in the imperial castle. And uh, I remember we were at that time already at our country place, I think it was June maybe, and we'd listened to the radio. And there was a report first that there'd been an attack on the, on the chancellor's office and then uh, the next news that came a couple of hours later is that in fact uh, they had taken over and uh, but the chancellor was fine. And then we knew what had happened because they started playing funeral music so that was sort of the, the scenario. And that is very, uh, very uh, engraved in my mind for mm. some strange reason. Yes, so it's, uh, and other things, you know, the importance of the military uh, was even, even, when, even when the Social Democrats were in charge was, was pronounced, for example, in, in physical education uh, we used to throw uh, fake grenades as exercise, you know, climb rope and all that. And so, 
you know, that, that kind of disciplinary attitude uh, was very strong. And then the next chancellor, a man by the name of Shushnik, uh, took over after the, the murder of the first chancellor. But he, uh, he was threatened by Hitler because the whole movement was, uh, first of all, he outla they outlawed the Nazi party. Mm -hmm. That didn't sit too well with Hitler. Mm -hmm. And he put a lot of pressure on Schuschnigg. Uh, now, we're talking about 35, 36, 37, those three years. Yeah. Uh, but we've, the Austrians, the fascist go government in Austria, felt protected by Mussolini, you know, because they were, and it, it shows you how evil and one, on, on one hand and how clever Hitler was. In 1937, I think it was the fall of 37, he invited Mussolini to witness uh, army maneuvers of the, of the German army, and it scared the hell out of Mussolini. Now there was no more protection of Austria, see, so that had disappeared. Mm. I, in the meantime, had enrolled in the gymnasium. My father felt that uh, either I was going to become a professional or maybe even a teacher. And, and so I went to a, a real gymnasium. There are two, to this, two branches even in the current system, yeah. a technical one, uh, science and engineering, uh, and a humanistic one. So if you went into law or, or, or uh, you know, the social sciences, uh, you got uh, eight years of Latin and eight years of Greek. I was only des destined for eight years of Latin or Greek, so I started <laughs> Latin. And that was, was the most difficult subject for me, actually. So uh, again, I lasted, uh, what, 37? You, st you start at the age of 10. Yeah. So I, I, I enrolled in the gymnasium. I passed the examination uh, in 35. And that was, in a sense, a less happy uh, period because it was very highly disciplined and there was open warfare between the teachers who were called professor and the students who were called already mister. At the age of 10 I became Herr Leitmann and I remember that they called me a fourfold ass in Latin. <laughs> Mr. Leitmann, you are an asinus quadratus. What did you do to uh, I to don't remember this? but I don't remember what <laughs> I did. Uh, or perhaps nothing. But we, we were also beaten. Oh my goodness. Yeah, you know, it, it was the kind of thing, put out your hand and then you get whacked on him. I mean, they, they didn't pummel you or anything, but that was the kind it of thing. It hurt punishment. enough, right? Yeah, no, it was, it, so that, there was open warfare. And on the other hand, the students did their best to disrupt the teacher, you know, put chalk on his seat, you know, and, and uh, put all kinds of nasty things on the floor so he would slip and you know, uh, thumbtacks on his seat, you know, that kind of thing. And I remember that very well because there was a little store where we bought our school supplies, paper and pencil and all that kind. Oh, it also sold little toys like little jumping things that you could rub them and they jumped all over the place, you know, and blew up or something. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's something that really stuck in my mind. And the only uh, major thing that happened, I think it was either the s probably the second year, uh, was that there was a girls' school just across the courtyard next to ours. This was an all-boys school, about 600 students. And we did our best to be able to peek into the girls' part of the place. You know, we thought maybe we would see them, you know, changing their clothes. There was a hope. And we stood on the toilets and tried to peer into that. And we got caught. So my whole form, there were, there were two classes in, in that particular form, was expelled for a whole semester. And so we had to take private uh, lessons. My father taught me everything but the Latin. And my old Latin professor, Professor Epstein, uh, was hired to uh, tutor me mathematics and uh, uh, Latin and actually I learned a lot more Latin being privately tutored for a semester 
than in class. So uh, those are things that do stick in my mind. Uh, it's, uh, it's strange because it's sort of little episodes that, uh, you know, I, I don't have a, a whole sense of the period, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it was the Archduke Rainer Real Gymnasium, which, by the way, before I forget, is now called the Sigmund Freud Real Gymnasium because he was their most uh, renowned graduate. He graduated from that school in 1873, Sigmund Freud. And he was a denizen of your neighborhood, was he not? Well, the, in, actually, yes. He, he lived in the second district, which was large, largely the large, largest part of the Jewish population, until he became very famous. His office was always in the central district, which was only across the Danube Canal. And uh, uh, he was pointed out to me uh, walking in a, a park called the Algarten, which was about three or four blocks from our house. There was a skating ring there, I learned ice skating there. And he you know, always pointed out the famous Professor Freud. He was already quite known by that time, of mm -hmm. course. And he always walked with his hands behind his back, the professorial walk, and little uh, my mustache and beard. Yeah. And uh, that sort of sticks in my mind. Again, how much of that was then later reinforced in terms of information, I can't tell. All I know is I, di I was exposed to it originally. Yeah. And then there were the additional things, you know, that I could go ice skating, a uh, ten-minute walk, mm. uh, got to be pretty good on ice skates, uh, twenty-minute walk to the amusement park, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and it's interesting because uh, it's, it's really apropos to my whole history. My father had a, a, a very sharp temper. You know, he, he blew up reasonably readily and immediately regretted it. Mm. Uh, so the, the worst punishment I ever got was he, he'd give me one of these slaps, you know. That mm -hmm. was, you know, there wasn't anything worse than that. But when, the, when we were kicked out that one semester for trying to look into the girls' part of the, the he, he didn't punish me. Mm because he, he remembered his own <laughs> boyhood, I think. All I know is that, you know, I was told not to do that, but, yeah. but I wasn't punished. Well, this absolute rigid segregation of the sexes and it it breeds true, a curiosity, it? was true until the 80s. Yeah. yeah it was 19, not co-ed until, until the 1980s. 1980s, there was a, yeah. a, a woman minister of uh, education, because I looked up, you know, the school was still only about 600 students, but it's now co-ed, right? Mm. And in, in a different building, it moved into another part of town. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's, that's very interesting. Yeah, th th no, I never, I never saw, I never had girl friends in that sense, yeah. because, you know, that's, that's where you, you get to know girls in school, right? you know? So uh, it was a big revelation when I came to the United States that t girls were really very nice. <laughs> they, they, indeed. Well, I, I wanted to uh, just sort of think about this uh, a bit more. There's, there's um, Austria-Hungary, end of World War I. Your father serves, uh, both of your uncles serve in World War I. They're the central powers. They're defeated. Um, there's, it, my history is bad for, for Austria-Hungary, but, but the, in Germany there were tremendous reparations payments to be made to the French and to, and to others, and it was uh, uh, crippling the German economy yeah. in, the, in, in the 20s, and there was hyperinflation. I don't know how much or to what degree that kind of instability also impacted Austria, yeah. if it was subjected to the same kind I of thing. I don't think that they got... Uh, that those major repar reparations, uh, but I think that certainly inflation, unemployment, was you know it's th throughout Central Europe, uh, yeah. you know, uh, certainly worse among the defeated nations, uh, but uh, it, it was bad. That's yeah. my uncle took a job in in the Soviet Union for that reason. Right. 
Uh, right. You know, he was a he was a graduate of Vienna the Technical, Technical University. University, and with as a chemical engineer, yeah. you think that would be some you know you'd be able to find work no, with that. No, I I sometimes wonder this. You know, I could not discuss this with my father because I saw him for the last last time when I was fourteen. Uh, I think he got this job for this armaments corporation run by the Austrian government. May well be through his his father's military connections. I, I mean, I have no Possibly, evidence yeah. for this, but it certainly didn't hurt. Yeah, you yeah. know, and and uh, so this this is certainly part of it. Uh, the the uh, the other kind of influence uh, of the military, I o only felt again. We had this home in the country where we spent the whole summer. And uh, I, I just dug up a little book, the Austrian military, a nice little book that they put out, the, the, uh, the Austrian military forces. It was published in 1937, still under the uh, fascist government. But uh, when we had a, a house in the country, there were maneuvers in the neighborhood. You know, it was an open countryside. And I somehow uh, walked into the field kitchen area, obviously, you know, and it became a pit. So that day, and they, it was it was a single comp a signal company. They were laying wires, you know, was, and all that. It was fascinating. They adopted yeah. me as a pit. I didn't go home that night. I mean, my parents the next morning were looking for me, and I wasn't there. And so they called the police and took about a day and a half before they found me with the military mm -hmm. because they, you know, uh, adopted me. <laughs> so I, I, that's, that's, it's this story of, of belonging, of your family, your extended family participating in, in the imperial state um, project, right? So advancing high in the military ranks. This is a high technology industrial nation. It's the f Austria is the fourth largest machine ma manufacturing state in the world at this time behind, yeah, yeah, yeah. behind Germany, uh, the UK, and the United States. Yeah. So it's right up there in terms of armaments Bigger than France. Bigger than France. Um, uh, pro manufacturer and exporter of high technology goods such as cars, railroad engines, right. aircrafts, its early oil industry is right. important. And so it's at the center of modernity, speaking of Sigmund Freud. So it's, it's, it's exporting um, goods, high technology goods, engineering, marvels, science, and... Well, in medicine, they were the leading nation, certainly under the emperor, you know. Uh, literature, music, you know. The uh, list goes on, yeah. doesn't it? Oh, no. It, it, it was... Uh, uh, no, I wasn't aware of that. I, no. I was aware of it only uh, when I was maybe already 10 or 12 years old that my parents would go to the opera, for example, uh, that kind of thing. And I think in, in, as long as we are on that topic, I was really brought up by my maternal grandmother, Fanny, who lived yeah. in the same apartment, owned the apartment house and everything. She was a very strong, smart lady and very funny. Uh, I still remember we always had the latest radios and, and gramophone equipment because of my father who had opened uh, uh, after he uh, stopped being an accountant uh, a uh, electronics electrical supply place and uh, my mother helped him in the office there so my grandmother really took care of me and uh, she would say things like turn on the radio maybe we'll hear something you know, that kind of sly thing. Oh, when, when she dropped the cup, she said, you see that it jumped out of my hand. <laughs> I mean, she had little sayings for this. Yeah. Uh, and, and she was a very bright woman. She always lived with us until uh, sh the day she died. She died, in fact, at home uh, many years later in the United States, mm. 1947. Mm. And I remember that she was already in a coma. Uh, and my, her son, Uncle Paul, and my mother were present. My other, uh, her, her other child, Aunt Elizabeth, had already moved to Hollywood with her daughter. Uh, and uh, so they weren't there. 
But she opened her eyes. I sat there next to the bed, and she said, am I still here? <laughs> and she died. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my I'll God. I'll never forget that. You know, by that yeah. time, of course, uh, I was a college student, yeah. uh, you know, but, uh, you know, these, these little, I don't call them anecdotes, I mean, these little, little bits jump back into one's mind as one, you know, uh, begins to think about it. Her strength of character and yet a lightness. Yes, a lightness yes, to so sort she, of, and, yeah. and uh, she was uh, witty. Uh, even when I, even when I started being a, a, a college student at Columbia University later, uh, and I was dating girls, she also had little uh, off-color things to say, uh, which I won't repeat now. But but you know she she had a real sense of humor. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so she she's certainly one of the most important people in my early life. There's no question about it. You were raised by her in part. Right? Yes. Because other grandmother I I immediately moved to her other daughter in San Francisco, so I had very little touch with her. Mm. And, you know, the, the Alexander's wife, Cecilia's. Right. Yeah. So Ed Adele was living here, and so that uh, that was uh, you know that. I, I didn't know her as well. Now, it is true that uh, we lived with her for a while. That's a period that I haven't talked about. But uh, uh, we were going to leave that until we talk about the Anschluss. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I was just thinking about the, the you know, there's this, this it's, it's, a, it's such an advanced nation. And your family is at the center of it. You're sent at the center of it geographically, and your father goes into the electronic supply business, so the very cutting edge of technology. Right. He was always interested in science, technology, and in expeditions and explorers. He did, in fact, just before he got married, the summer before, uh, he was a volunteer for a dig in, I think, Egypt, somewhere in the Middle East. You know, he really wanted, and, and then. Uh, to make up for, for maybe giving me a slap or something, he immediately made up by the two main things I remember. And both of these places still exist, a uh, science and, and uh, really an astronomy center called Urania. It was a big building. It had lecture halls. It, it had, had a, a observatory. An observatory, right. Observatory. Yeah. It was all rebuilt after the war, and it's, it's in beautiful shape now, right on the Ringstrasse, which is the, the big boulevard around, and on the Danube Canal right there. And I used to be taken there to, uh, first of all, to see movies. Uh, they showed a lot of movies, uh, you know, about explorations and stuff. I still remember one explorer that he was always talked about was Sven Hedin. I think he was an Arctic explorer, Norwegian, I think. Uh, he had uh, a, a affinity for foreign countries. Uh, I think the only foreign country that he went to, aside from Serbia, was France and Great Britain. He never got beyond that. He and my Uncle Fritz used to go to the football games. In, in fact, in 1934, they went to, to the... Uh, uh, Oh, it's the international football game, the World Cup. World Cup. Yeah. Brought me toys back from there. You know, that kind of thing. Always interesting toys. Mm -hmm. I got a little generator, and I could generate enough power so that you could really feel it, you know, but not kill yourself. <laughs> a little airplane, yeah. uh, a, a crystal radio, you know, where you fooled around. With and could you, could you get uh, broadcasts from I could get broadcasts uh, just with earphones, mm -hmm. right. It was a lot of fun because I used, used to hide under the blanket with a flashlight and do that kind of thing. Uh, so these are things that stick in my mind. And uh, just as, a, as, as an aside, because it's something that you always read in either the biographies, the autobiographies of pe people like Schnitzler, you know, who was a famous author, is that the, the sex education of the middle class boys was usually performed by the maids. You know, in some way, you know, maybe it was oral, maybe, maybe it was just manual, whatever, it was that kind of thing. 
And in the summer of 37, we had a young lady who, she must have been about 16 or 17, and we, uh, we lived in adjoining uh, parts of the, uh, of the veranda, which was enclosed with, with, uh, with uh, netting because we had mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she taught me certain things, and we were caught in flagrante by my grandmother, Fanny. She was fired and had to leave within one hour. Oh, my goodness. And that young lady came from the same birthplace as Hitler's birthplace, Brownau on the Inn, mm. which is the, the connection in my mind, you oh know. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's terrible yeah. that she yeah. got sent down for that. You yeah, know? well, yeah. you know. That was uh, it was called improper behavior. Yes. I still remember the German improper behavior. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, you had you had a, in many ways a kind of standard middle class education that was um, had this emphasis on technology. So even the, the toys were educational. Right. A dynamo, getting interested in the right. fundamental principles right. of electricity. Absolutely. A chemistry set, which yeah. was a staple for boys at least right. from which, at least from that time until yeah. you know until which I misused. my day. Yes. I almost, almost blew up the apartment. I misused mine as well. But yeah. I understand you, you literally almost blew up your apartment. Well I dropped, I still remember what I dropped sodium permanganate crystals into a hy uh, hydrochloric acid and it made a nice little red cloud and then it turned whoosh. And what saved my eyesight was my grandmother who immediately rushed me under the shower, mm. you know. So it, she was important to my life. Yeah, yeah, very yeah important. a guardian angel. Yeah, definitely. Really, really. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're exposed to it. You know, outside of the school system, your father is is um, showing you things, introducing you to ideas, introducing you to technology, and you also took English as well, which I found so yeah. it wasn't well, part both, of your regular curriculum. Both my mother and my father had already had English in school. Okay. You know, my mother also went to some kind of commercial college, uh, and uh, so. They, yeah, they, they, in fact, last communication I had from my father, he always wrote to me in English. He worked for the Red Cross there for a while, and so it's, uh, yeah. No, they, 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 they had foresight, and uh, certainly my father was very stern, but had a soft heart. And later on, you know, we talked about this before, what really did I absorb from my father or my parents, other than, of course, from Grandma Fanny? And I could spend, you know, five minutes on this because I tried to, in the last few weeks at night, think about, you know, what strange character traits do I have and where did they come from? For example, I'm an extremely controlled personality. I never lose my temper. I pout once in a while, but I never lose my temper. And that came into, into play later on when I was uh, at the Nuremberg Trials. I never lost my temper. And I had good reasons to do so, but I didn't. And I think it had to do with the fact that my father did lose his temper. And I said to myself, I'll never let myself do that, you know. Uh, I, and I'm sure that this was something that I learned by osmosis, mm. you know. Other things that I learned was my father was an early collector of lots of things, paintings, uh, uh, artifacts. Uh, uh, he had Etruscan axes and stuff, you know, and he had a cabinet, even at his, his mother's apartment, uh, who lived about 20, 25 min minutes from us on the, on the Do Danube Canal. And to this day, I suffer from that, you know, I, I put stuff all over the house, uh, it's, uh, and I still to this day go to internet auctions and buy things that I, you know, that I'm going to leave to my daughter who turned into a, a painter. And uh, so it's, it's uh, those are certainly things that one learns either by, in a negative way, by not doing something, mm -hmm. and then in a positive way, uh, you know, like 
you know, collecting, going to auctions, stuff like that. So I'm sure that that was a direct influence. Uh, my mother less so, except that she was a great cook. And so maybe the, uh, the uh, you know, the love of, uh, of good food. Now, my mother never drank a drop of alcohol in her whole life, not mm -hmm. one drop. Uh, you know, the, the fact that, that uh, we were not religious, starting with my parents' uh, generation, yeah. was that I learned later, and that was verified by some of my cousins, the ones from, from the delicatessen candy store, Cousin Kay uh, and Cousin Martha, the, the, the youngest, the boy, Kurt, uh, was a statistician. He, in, the, in the states, and, and uh, later became head of the publish uh, the public uh, health system in the Ma state of Maryland for some reason. Then one of the statisticians in that job. Uh, so uh, we sort of learned from each other. And my cousin Martha was a real tomboy. We used to climb up on the roof deck in our little house in the country, and there was a freeway, a highway anyway, maybe six, seven blocks away, and we used to blind the tourists with mirrors. You know, that kind of thing. Right, yeah. You know, that, that kind of, oh, and she once gave me an inverted Mohawk haircut. <laughs> right through the middle, she shaved my head. <laughs> she said, it'll look great. Yeah. No, just, <laughs> just, the two just hold still. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, she, she only died last year. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's 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 very interesting. So you got from collecting. What what's happening there when you when you when you collect uh, um, art, and the the impression I'm getting from what you learned from your father is this admiration and awe at the world. You're going out and you, you're yeah, appreciating. Yeah, the fact that he was interested in exploration. Uh, he had books, which I had until fairly recently when our daughter moved in here. I got rid of a lot of books. There was a book in German called Cowboys, Gauchos, Gauchos and Vaqueros. You know, and I'm, I'm sure he, he would have loved to go to South America, for example. Yeah. You yeah. know, that kind of thing. He was in touch with people like the Minister of War of Afghanistan. He had a, a noble friend who, we never had a car. Uh, who had a, a car. In fact, I have a uh, cigarette case that this count gave my father. It has the little crown on and everything. It's in that cabinet. Uh, they may have been gone, maybe they went fishing together. I know he was picked up by car and they, they went off. Uh, maybe he's just drinking beer for all I know. <laughs> but on Yom Kippur, when I to this day fast, to prove that I'm not irreligious because it's inconvenient. Uh, and, uh, and our son, uh, we're from a very, uh, uh, you know, ecumenical family. Uh, he used to go down and visit Uncle Fritz on Yom Kippur, while my grandmother and maybe my mother also went to the synagogue on just those two holidays. And, uh, I was told that they drank schnapps and had ham sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely in the agnostic camp. And, yes, and I think so. Yeah, I yeah, think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's very interesting how one can be religious and then suddenly become agnostic or atheist even. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll touch on that when we talk about, you know, the, the, the Nazi period yeah. thereafter. I think, yeah, go ahead, Troy. Yeah, well, so I won't, I won't mention this now. It's just that it's, again, something that, that uh, you know, occurred to me later in life, you know, something that I learned from my father. That's what you do in, in opposition, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very interesting. And, and, of course, at the time this happens, you have no idea that you're learning something. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it just somehow sinks in and... And it stays for a long time. I've forgotten lots of things. You know, I, if I look at papers I wrote, I don't know how I got from here to there now, right. but I do remember. So, for example, I remember, uh, just to really go back, a little jingle that I learned in that uh, French school, you know, mm. when, when in I was the in French kindergarten. I can recite it to you. 
le bœuf der ox, la vache des coups, fermer la porte du tueur marteau. See? They popped into my head yeah. just the other day. Yeah. You yeah. know? These And I can sing all the Nazi songs. Oh my goodness. Yes. Oh my yes. goodness. It yeah. was that, um, I guess, that present in the public domain. I mean, yeah. it's unforgettable, of course, for you because yeah, of the but change. I mean, you, most people, I think, can consciously suppress these things. Yeah. Yeah. And and to me, uh, you know. As I get older, of course, it pops up more. Right. You know, because I guess the other the circuits become empty and the other stuff comes back. In. <laughs> I don't know about that. Anyway. But I, I think the, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I'm curious about, I guess because I, I keep harping on the, on the Austrian imperial kind of side of things, is this question of belonging. Um, there is this insider, outsider status for your family there in those years you're to to some degree the ultimate insiders in that you're in the center of this of this empire nation yeah. that uh, is doing well that is welcomed and accepted has been has received the, some of the highest honors uh, for service to the state so they feel and, and you said your your grandfather and your father were patriots Um, and and believed in this place and in this people, and they saw themselves as Austrians. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's in, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I don't know. There, there was a book called "The Pity of It All" that deals with relations between the Jews and the Germans over the last three uh, hundred years or something like that. And when emancipation came about, middle 19th century, uh, the question was, and in Germany this was a particularly, I, I, I didn't encounter that, at least not consciously, uh, were they going to be called German Jews or Jewish Germans? And it was very important to be called a Jewish German, not a German Jew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There were big debates about that. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. just, uh, and there were different responses because there was a kind of an ongoing. Uh, um, Jews would be w would would be welcomed into uh, a, a positive relationship with an uh, with an authority. It could be like an emperor or a king or whatever, and uh, and that was one strategy, and that involved kind of. Uh, Assimilation to yeah, some degree, absolutely It'd be linguistic, cultural, and all yeah. of that. Um, and then another response in, it, I guess, further east would be the kind of um, more radical separation. So the Hasidim movement, the Hasidic movement, to sort of have a kind of yeah. And also, existence. also, I think the involvement of Jews, say, in the Russian Revolution, mm -hmm. again, you know, in in response to what had been done to them, uh, you know, for a couple of more than a couple of centuries right you know, yeah. right yeah yeah and so there are, there are things that there's there's a tremendous there's a tremendous uh, stability to Europe to some degree as 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 the um, uh, in the in the sort of period leading up to World War one there's this yeah. prosperity and commercial advance and, and global trade. And um, you had this enlightened emperor, Franz Josef, who was very, um, if not completely welcoming, very tolerant of the presence of Jews in, yeah. this, in the in part of the state apparatus. Yeah, and they, they even en ennobled the Jewish families, like the Rothschilds, people like that, you right, know, right. became barons. And, you know, that's, uh, no, it, 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 it's interesting because under Kaiser Wilhelm in Germany, Jews could become non-commissioned officers in the army, but not commissioned officers until the First World War. Then enough officers got killed, and and that's when they could become commissioned. Right. I don't know how high they could get, but at least they could become lieutenants or captains or something like that. Right, right. And so in the in the aftermath of World War One, there was uh, there was unemployment, there was inflation, there was instability, 
and um, also this Wilsonian self-determination principle. And that begins this, well, doesn't begin it, but it, it accelerates a notion of nation matching with peoples and peoples being defined ethnically and racially. And so that leads to all of the, the, um, the, the acceleration of anti-Semitism of a very particular kind. Um, do you have any recollections of an experience of anti-Semitism that you would recognize as a, of course, you're a child? Well, no, certainly not till the Nazis came. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we had one, one family member who actually converted. Uh, my mother had a second cousin, maybe a third cousin, but it was a fisher who was a tenor, fairly well uh, known and regarded tenor, Ernst Fischer, uh, who was also a member of the La Scala company where he was known as Ernesto Piscatore. I remember that. And in this, again, this is not first hand, I, I found this out later on, he, he uh, decided that it would really do uh, him a lot of good professionally if he converted. And he did. But at that time, the Archbishop Cardinal, his name was Initzer, so this was in the early middle 30s, uh, he was able to approach and wanted to know if the, the Archbishop Cardinal of Vienna would be the, the converting priest, you know, the one who would. And I remember the, the line was, now, Mr. Fisher, I know that you're not doing this because you want to be a Christian. <laughs> and he says, you will have to do with an ordinary priest. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but that's the only even story that I know that has any bearing on, on this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. No, there were, there were anti-Semitic politicians in yeah. Austria, one of the mayors of Vienna before my, long before my time, uh, you know, was, and, and, uh, but uh, beyond that, you know, I really had no, no idea about this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it was just that there was, Leopoldstadt was the second district, which is across the river, across the canal from, from central Vienna. Right. And it was, uh, it wasn't, you wouldn't describe it as a Jewish ghetto, because it was, no, it was only... Never, no, no, it was yeah. never, never a ghetto. In fact, you know, even though the majority of the Jews lived there, and this has, I think, a lot to do with, of course, if you go two or three hundred years earlier, they were still burning Jews on a pyre, you know, in Vienna. Mm -hmm. And then a better emperor would come along and suddenly, so Leopold was the predecessor of, I don't know, Leopold the I, I don't know, uh, of Franz Joseph. And that part of Vienna was called Leopold City. So what, and I, I don't know whether this was a, because it did good things or bad things, but uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't remember it. Uh, there was certainly never anything in school that uh, you know indicated that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And there was, I imagine, there was prayer in school. There was, uh, or or not? Was there any uh, kind of there, there was chapel? prayer. Well, there was prayer, and in those days there were still crucifixes in the classrooms. But that was true until fairly recently in, yeah. in Austria. I mean, it's a very Catholic place. Yeah, right. Place. Yeah. Uh, and first of all, Jews were always excused from that. And there was Jewish uh, instruction on Saturdays, which was voluntary, that kind of thing. Uh, we did not have school on Saturday, for example. But it, in Austria, the, you could have had three holidays a week because Friday was the Muslim holiday, so he only worked four days a week. <laughs> so I don't know. Sign up a lot and then yeah. you can... Because, yeah. you know, uh, if you look at uh, the composition of Austro-Hungary, and uh, uh, it was really a very multinational state. You know, you look at the Balkans, almost all the Balkans were part of Austria. Uh, even uh, during my parents' time, the, the Italian border was at Trieste. So the Austrian navies, uh, 
which was one of the largest navies, navies in the world, you know. They had to be in the Adriatic and go out into the Mediterranean and the rest of it through the Adriatic. So the whole, the whole Adriatic east coast was Austrian, down to Albania. And uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's very interesting. And I know, for example, that later on my Italian friends used to tell me that their parents always took their honeymoons in Austria, in Vienna, you know. So, it, it, you know, it was... Uh, but then you have the enmity even to this day about South Tyrol and, and uh, you know, the, the Alto Adige region of France. That's still in, in, in under discussion. Is yeah. it Austria? Is it Italy? Mm -hmm. And right now, this is the main political point with the current government of Austria. Mm -hmm. They want Alto Adige to be reunited with... Uh, and now, I, I do remember that we, we used to sing patriotic songs. And Andreas Hofer was an Austrian hero who stood against the Italians. In other words, he was the leader of the people from South Tyrol, and we used to, we used to sing songs about him, Andreas Hofer's hero. Again, this, this, the, the name popped into my mind. Mm -hmm. So th th that kind of thing still existed. The, the, the enmity <coughs> after the, during and after the First World War was also directed against the Italians because in those days, of course, they were allies of, the, you know, the, the, the West. Right. And they were called perfidious Italians, right. just as the Germans called the, the British perfidious a Albion. It was called perfidious Albion. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that kind of thing happens in multinational, particularly when, you know, nationalism was just rising. Yeah, that's right. You know, I mean, Germany was unified in the 19th century. Italy was unified. Now, there, were, there were lots of principalities and got that kind of thing. But uh, really, a unified national government didn't exist in many of those countries. And what's that phrase uh, or that term, irredentism? So there's this sense that there's a, if there's a minority within a, a country and there's another uh, sort of nation that has uh, that, that ethnicity or that linguistic yeah. group, and they want to sort of be united with that, or they want to redraw the borders to conform to some idea of nation. Yeah, yeah. And that's certainly the Balkans are a main example of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe even the Middle East now, I don't know, but that's another story. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but uh, so th this is the great danger of, of extreme nationalism, is that it leads to that kind of thing uh, that you... You, you, it makes you feel superior. I think a lot of it has is, there's a psychological basis for that. Uh, the human beings like to be superior. You know, I don't know why, but uh, it's it's uh, it, it 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 has puzzled me for a long time. You know, why? What is the necessity for? You know, it was Greater Germany. Mm -hmm. Now it's going to be Greater America, I guess, kind of thing. Yeah. So you get you get that kind of thing. That you're better than they are, therefore you you deserve more. I think a lot of that has to do with you. Yeah, selling entitlement. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah. and uh, creating a scapegoat. Yes, and and very often there's an economic basis because you know sometimes that subgroup uh, somehow ha is in a, a lower economic uh, uh, class, and and that immediately, of course, is is a point that begins to rub. And, and uh, is 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 already already part of the population for for extremism, but whatever. Yeah, you know. Well, certainly, what's happening during that time period? If you look at the United States, um, the cities are doing better than the countryside almost everywhere. Yeah. Right. And so, and for the longest time, it was the opposite. <laughs> That's would, right. You would you in the in the cities, you'd get sick and die. Yeah. <laughs> basically, but. But uh, with the transformations of, of the technological transformations, there's just a greater, greater gap between the cities and the country yeah. in terms of income and prosperity and comforts and all of yeah. that. And the extra layer in the case of um, in the case of Austria is you have this largely Christian uh, Catholic countryside, and you have a polyglot 
multi-ethnic, multi-religious, uh, multi-religious right. right. um, uh, uh, cities that are that are uh, have connections across the globe and are doing well and are doing relatively better. Uh, I don't I don't want to um, overinterpret what's happening in Austria, but there is uh, there's an, a rural urban divide that is increasing after World War One in particular. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and so there's there's all kinds of opportunities to take advantage of that politically, and that's something that. Well, let me put this as a question, and I don't. I can. We can only draw from your youthful experience and what you learned after the fact from what other people told you who were adults at the time. Was there a sense that? What began to happen in the 1930s was an infection that came from Germany, or was it finding fertile ground in Vienna, in Austria? Well, uh, there, there, there had been a movement even in the 1920s. After all, Hitler uh, lived there for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, that that there is uh, <coughs> that the, the, the Austrians are really belong to the German race, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and, that, uh, and Hitler took advantage of that in a very clever way. Uh, Austria uh, was essentially the bulwark uh, against the Huns. You know, they, they were essentially the buffer that protected uh, the, the German nation in the largest sense, you know. So, uh, and there was a group of people who, who bought that very early on. You know, they were obviously economically uh, deprived. They weren't the only ones, but there they found fertile ground. And uh, that started already right after the First World War. The veterans, for example. Then anti-Semitic propaganda flourished in those days because there was this whole myth about the Jewish... Uh, Merchants who were making a lot of money on the war, the Rothschilds, yeah. right? Yeah, and, yeah. and just yeah. in general. Yeah, and, and the the, the uh, elders of Zion is that a tract that? Came well, out that yeah, that that's a, a, bit a story that that existed already, I think, in other countries, of course. Yeah. Uh, even the, even in in Great Britain, there was that right. kind of thing. Right. But uh, no, just uh, just the whole uh, and and the. Uh, but the, a very interesting thing happened. It just occurred to me. And this was really internally very sad and divisive. There were the Eastern Jews and the Western Jews. And the Western Jews always felt superior. So in, in Poland, in, in Eastern countries like Romania and those places where the Jews lived in little towns uh, and were usually poor, uh, you know, they were tradesmen and, and, and uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, there was always a certain amount of, wouldn't call it enmity, but certainly a, a resistance uh, to the, the Eastern Jews. And they became also the caricatures, right. you see. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and I think it's very sad, but, but then, you know, you had the two groups of Jews, you know, the Ashkenazi and the Sephardic Jews. So the Jews in, in Spain were already were superior, you know, because after all, you know, they were the philosophers and what have you. Yeah. And, and, and so you, and then uh, uh, it, it led to really sad things, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and it, it's, uh, this is why I always felt and certainly feel for a long time that We've got to judge individuals and yeah. not groups of individuals, and it's it's uh, very scary when when people act on mass. Yeah. And I see this in political rallies, whether it's in Nazi Germany or the United States, people shouting slogans. And Hitler was a genius; to, he took advantage of all that. Yeah. You see, I mean, he he, he wasn't stupid. You know, he wasn't stupid, and and uh, I remember that in the 30s, where we always had the best radio shortwave and everything, 
We used to listen to Hitler's speeches, and I even became a mimic of his speeches and used to amuse people at, at parties in my parents' house by making a, a speech a la Hitler when I was you know, 12 years old. I could shout like that and, and say nothing. Because if you listen to many of his speeches, it was slogans. Yeah. And so you would mock that. Yeah. And, and it, you know, it generates this laughter. And, uh... but, but it was, a, it was in a sense, humor of the gallows. Yeah. You know, because uh, we, we had <clears throat> even relatives in Germany, uh, but there was still the belief that, you know, it isn't going to happen to the assimilated people, or certainly there was no idea of being annihilated. Maybe we would have to leave. Yeah. That, that was always a possibility and a fear, uh, you know. But it also, I think, in, in my family's case, my father, not until uh, Kristallnacht did he realize, you know, that this was really, there was only one way and that was to leave. Until that time, he wasn't so sure. Yeah. You know, it could go away. We had anti-Semitism before. This will go away, kind of. Thing. Yeah, I guess that's. Uh, I guess that is a part of it, and that anti-Semitism has been with the Jews for such a long time, and it's come in waves. Yeah, as you say, yeah. and it, it's gone away. And there, there was a pogrom, and but we persevered. We survived. Not well, this... in France, they had the Dreyfus affair, right? Right. For example. Right. You know, so even right in the, the most progressive democratic countries, that can happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, historically, that's, uh, that's, uh, but it does lead to this false hope, you see, when it begins to creep in and on you, there's always this sort of sub rosa hope that, you know, this is temporary. Yeah. And you mentioned one thing which does really become ubiquitous, not just in Germany or Austria, but in the United States and Canada and other places, which is race science. And that really takes off at the turn of the century and, and just accelerates. It, be, it begins to shape and govern the, the social sciences, and it, it's at the heart of the sciences, or what we think we know about human beings, is that there are these races and they have these characteristics. Well, you know, uh, after all, the, the racial policies of Germany Nazi Germany were made scientific. You know, there was their philosopher Rosenberg who wrote a big tome on this, and the Nuremberg Laws were enunciated. You know, what percentage of of a Jew are you or not? Kind of thing, uh, very mathematically. But part of that was already in existence in in Great Britain in the in the eighteen hundreds. Absolutely. Yeah. So you know it isn't it's, these things don't just spring up. No. You know, they, they they just as in the sciences, we'll we'll stand on somebody else's shoulders kind yes. of thing. Yeah. And and it, it was very well it was very insidious, but it was it was done very cleverly by these people. And and if you you know, if you look at what the scientification of racism was really brought to to a crux because, I mean, there, there was ra there's racism, there was ra there's racism, but it but it's a, a much more diffuse kind of thing. It's it's a feeling, mm -hmm. and it isn't really uh, made lawful, you know. Yeah. Uh, and it's in Germany, it, it you know it became the law of, it, to give you stupid ideas, and I, I was still involved in this personally, because if you look at my passport, my German passport, there's a big J. I have a, the swastika right on the passport, but over it is a big J. And all Jewish men by 1939, the middle of 39, had to have middle names, namely had to be what? The women had to be called Sarah, and the men had to be called... Israel? What? Israel, yeah. 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 Just a mark, to have a mark that, yeah, that yeah. identifies. It, yeah, then, of course, that was the yellow star and all that. Yeah. Know, that was uh, uh, but another, another clever move. Yeah, yeah. To, to distance. Yeah. Um, and I think there's all, uh, you know, um, there was such concern about 
um, urbanization and, uh, and this, I'm, I'm not speaking of Europe, I'm just talking about the United States, <laughs> this concern about uh, degeneration, racial degeneration. And um, uh, they thought about maintaining r racial health in terms of intermarrying the best. Th think, you know, it, it not altogether different from cattle breeding. So you no, want, that's like, the right. Best. But you had it at both ends. You had euthanasia at one end yeah. to purify the race by getting rid of people that weren't, you know, normal. Yeah. Uh, on the one hand, and that's right. And you know, it, it's it's interesting. Uh, we will get to this maybe a little bit later on. But I made really deep, deep friends with with Germans of my own generation, which is much more difficult. Not with, it's not a problem with the current generation. Uh, and then find out that way back in their own experiences, sometimes they only found, found out fairly recently, they suffered exactly from the same kind of, uh, you know, racism mm -hmm. or, or, or uh, idiocy kind of thing, you know. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, and, and, there were people that uh, really believed, I think, it wasn't necessarily a, a, a racist thing in, in, the, in the sense of, uh, say, anti-Semitism or whatever. They really felt that they could better, I mean, th there were these scientists, you know, looked at facial features, uh, right. that kind of thing. Yeah, phrenology. Phrenology and... and, and uh, uh, Breeding, you know, in yes. other words, yeah. making, and and this whole idea was really uh, done in the best way by the Nazis. This whole idea of the Aryan race. I mean, Hitler may have been a little man with black Brown hair, eyes. Yeah. yeah, right. So you know, there had to be excuses, yeah. uh, but blonde and and fair skinned and that kind of thing, and then. Uh, Nordic and yeah. Nordic and yeah and, and the whole harking back harkening back to to the Nibelungen kind of thing yeah. you know, this, there's there's a long history these things you know they, they didn't just spring up right you know there was a very famous writer and humorist by the name of Wilhelm Busch I don't know whether you came across him uh, wrote wonderful books with rhymes and stuff which were prop proper for kids you know I I had all his books, hmm. but then then he also had had the Semitic tracts and stuff like that. Again, based essentially on on purity of race. Hmm. You know, it, it, he was nineteenth uh, century, uh, uh, and and uh, a Jew, this springs up everywhere. Yeah, uh, and and then the the excuse very often is that you pick on a particular person. Who did bad things, and then simply spread it out over the whole group. Yep. You know, for example, the, the 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 program of the Kristallnacht, which extended over a number of days. It was a Polish young Polish Jew who shot a German diplomat in Paris. Yeah, von Rath. Von Rath. Yeah. 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 And then the whole thing was, you know, it it, it got to be clearly a directed. Program when you looked at what what uh, what uh, came out of it. Now the, the the physical manifestation of burning synagogues and and uh, you know whatever that came out of the propaganda, but the preparations for it are so clear because within days they imposed, for example, a penalty, a law, I mean a legal penal, a, a, a financial penalty. It would all wor worked out to a T. Yeah, you know so. So this wasn't something that just happened. It was just very convenient that this guy, uh, you know, uh, shot the German diplomat, and then you know you have a little, or, or you know, after Tax. all, yeah. well, in Germany, you know, the, the idea of having the Reichstag fire mm -hmm. blamed on a communist. Yeah. So within a day or two, you could pick up all the communists and throw them in concentration camps. You see. Yeah. Yeah. But this is this is all very cleverly planned. These these people 
most of them had PhDs, you know, after all, like Goebbels and those people, you know, they, they weren't they weren't stupid in, this, in, in that, that sense. Uh, and were experts in, in propaganda and... and yeah, Leni Riefenstahl, yeah. you know, uh, an amazing woman, absolutely amazing. And, and uh, obviously highly intelligent, smart, but she could overlook things because the important thing was that Hitler gave a great deal of support mm -hmm. to making movies. Now, if the movies happen to be propaganda movies, that's another thing. It's a piece of art, mm -hmm. you know. After all, she was really the inventor of the of the party rallies in Nuremberg, you know. Yeah. And you get this. You get this. Uh, even today, in, in, in places like China, for example, you get the same thing. I mean, uh, who, who directed uh, the, the, the Olympics in Tokyo? It was a movie director. Hmm. And it was, very, it was very nationalistic. When you go now, it was a beautiful spectacle until you sort of take it apart. And you, I saw the Nazi rallies in that. Hmm. You know, I saw in the cinemas. Beijing Olympics? Or? Yeah. yeah. I said, I've seen this before. Uh -huh. And it wasn't, you know, I think a happenstance that the person who directed it was a very famous movie director, mm -hmm. you know. The seduction of images, the seduction of symbols. And, and, and it's, it's, a, it's something that appeals to something basic in people, but because in the sense we want to be together. And, and the most terrible things happen because guilt is now diffused, you know. You, if I do something bad, a million people did the same thing, so I'm only guilty a millionth of, of, of the guilt, you know. And that's, that's a very powerful thing, yeah. you know. And so rallies, political rallies, here, there, everywhere, where people shout, USA, USA, or mm -hmm. Hitler, Hitler. It's the same thing. And it, it frightens me. Do it you really frightens me. So you see things since then. You have seen things in different countries, in different contexts that remind you yeah, of that time. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You get it in France with uh, Le Pen and, uh, you know, again, uh, the, the, the chanting. Yeah. You know, because you, you, first of all, you feel much more powerful because you're not alone. Or yeah. in the small, so the bigger the group, the, the more noisy they are, you know, the, and, and, and spectacles. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the, the, the uh, 1936 rally, which is sort of the precursor to all this, it, 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 it's, there's something in your stomach that says, oh, this is terrific. Mm -hmm. Well, just taking the, the, the imagery down to the uniforms, there's something, there's, there's something really seductive about yeah. they paid very, very careful attention to what would be attractive to people. And they they just amplified that to the nth degree, and there's also a sense I think of of uh, in that in the confusion, uh, sowing confusion, sowing doubt, yeah. accusing your enemies of that of which you're most guilty, right? To sort of distract. Someone yeah. says you're doing that. No, you're doing that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, that's right. It's it's uh, well, it, it, you know the the uh, sort of answer from people who either are Holocaust deniers or at least poo-poo the Holocaust or say it's not a German invention. It was fake they news, go, right? Yeah. No, but no, they go to the war wars. Who invented the concentration camp? The British. I, I, I heard this story many times, you know, when I was involved in, in the trials and then even interrogating people outside that. That was very, no, 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 we didn't invent that. That, that was really the, the British who invented that, you know, and, and to some extent that's true. Yeah, you know? I mean, that's also an, op it is true, and it, it is um, uh, an opportunity for reflection, that instead of saying only the Nazis did bad things, yeah. it's an opportunity I to mean, say, look, at, in our history, we have yeah, these things yeah, that are bad. Yeah, so, yeah. so that's a, it's, it's a, it, where we're talking around something that we're, we're going to get into um, uh, next time, which is uh, a real turning point in your life and the life of your family. Um, but I think I wanted this session to be about 
um, uh, those formative years, that family, those ancestors who shaped your life and the, their enthusiasms, their passions for learning, for art, for music, um, even if you didn't like your didn't piano, piano lessons very much. No. But they exposed you to all. Yeah, it's, an, it's an opportunity that I and people, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in my circumstances got that maybe a lot of people didn't. And, and, and that's one of the problems, Yeah, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, that's why it's so important to, to support uh, organizations uh, or, or milieus or metiers, you know, things that, that you can do uh, to allow people to do that and not, uh, you know, pick up the worst things, maybe pick up the best. Right. Some people will always pick up the worst things. It's just <laughs> mankind isn't that great. That's why I like, I like dogs. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. But educational opportunity, and that was, um, you know, uh, something that your, your parents were deeply invested in, 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 not just in the school, but outside in you know, yeah. taking you, exposing you to experiences. And that was, that was formative for you. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that, of course. You know, I hadn't given that conscious thought uh, for a long time because you know, I was just too busy. But, uh, uh, but it's certainly true, you know. And this is really, I think, the, the to my mind, main problem of minorities in the United States, other places too, of course. Uh, those minorities where the family is very strong, it gives the kids opportunities to learn, uh, do a lot better than those who don't. And so this, this is not this is sort of the, the, the obvious denial of, of the racial aspects of those problems, is that it's really the opportunities, the history, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, because, you know, I, I, sometimes, you know, people say to me, well, look at the terrible life you have had, you know, a certain period of time, lost your father, all that kind of thing, and you still did well. So there must be something, you know, it must be a, a, a better racial stock. And, oh and, and, and you know, yeah. but so you, you, you begin to think about that. This, this is a such complete nonsense, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, but, it, but it's appealing because yeah. it's, it's an excuse for not doing well. Right, right. But you can see that the patterns are there, the, the access to educational opportunity, a strong and uh, safe family, a stable, safe family yeah, environment. I think that's, that's maybe even more important than formal education. Right, right. You know, because a lot of the worst people in the world among the Nazis had very fine formal educations, you know, so that's not, not enough. Mm -hmm. It's certainly one aspect of it, but it's, that it's some, just, you know, it's not sufficient. So, uh, you know, you, you, you don't want to be, as a professor, I, I don't want to poo-poo education. Right, no, of course. But, but, you know, I say it's not enough. Yeah. It's not enough. Yeah. You know. And maybe next time we'll talk to you about, um, you know, the kind of Hannah Arendt banality of evil thing. So that there's, it's not just uh, someone's personal individual trauma that leads them to do bad things. There is something about institutions. There's something about oh, yeah. the direction that a collective can go that can make things worse. Well, that's, that bell is probably a good time for, for us to, no, it's probably a good time for us to stop and we can, we can pause and we'll take up next time. Terrific.